The epidemic of childhood obesity has tripled over the last three decades in America. Today, one in three children are overweight across the nation. We are taking a closer look into the increasing rise of childhood obesity and what our community is doing to tackle this ongoing issue. I'm Rene Kamal. Our Issues Twin Cities starts now. One of the biggest concerns that surrounds childhood obesity are the health problems, such as high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and diabetes. As the number of overweight children in the United States continues to rise, the risk of becoming overweight adolescents and adults is more likely, placing them at a risk of developing chronic diseases, such as heart disease, later in life. When we look at obesity, not only in children, but in adults as well, it's really a societal issue. And if we look at our food system, what has really happened over the past 30 years, we've gone from eating real, whole food to processed food. And when you look at processed food, the value for the manufacturers is in the processing, so it's not really in the food. So one of their key is about increasing the amount of processed food. So, you know, that whole issue with McDonald's when they had the super size and then when the, I don't know what they called it, but it was oh, a biggie and that whole thing. Because there's money in increasing how much people are eating, but yet they're not eating real food. They're all eating processed food. So what we're finding is there's a lot of children and adults for, for that matter as well that are really obese, but they're actually starving because of lack of nutrition within the food they're eating. You know, if you take a 12 ounce bag of potato chips for three bucks versus a pineapple for three bucks, which one has the most nutrient, but yet a lot of people will go for the potato chips. So they're, they're having all this increased calorie. It's calorie dense and nutrient. There's no nutrients in it. People no longer eat nutrient dense food. They're eating calorie dense food. It's not in school. It's not in children. It's really a societal issue. Do you think it's also because, um, you know, healthy organic food tends to be more expensive? If we put organic aside, because organic at this point is more expensive. 50 years ago, you know, when I grew up, the only thing I knew was organic. I didn't know it was organic because yeah. that's just the way we rose, you know, food was raised. So let's put organic aside for a minute. Whole food is less expensive than processed food. But over the years, I know that more people, more and more people don't know how to cook. So again, society has changed. Manufacturers have changed. We've presented convenient food. Convenient food is very expensive. You can buy a whole chicken, a whole chicken for about four or five bucks. Okay. Feed a family of six. You will buy chicken nuggets, 12 ounce, they'll be more expensive, about six bucks. Processed food is more expensive, but people don't know how to cook. You know, a kid doesn't even know how to use a knife and a fork because we've made everything so easy for them. It's all finger food. So they snack, they don't sit down and eat a real meat. So I'll argue that good healthy food is no more expensive than junk, but people you know, look at that bag of potato chip and they look at that pineapple or melon and they go, oh my God, this is so expensive. But it's not. Actually, the cost per serving and the cost per nutrient is a lot lower. What are obese children typically at risk for? Every adult onset diseases that's out there, young children are now open to it. Whether it's type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. And I think one of the most prominent things that's happening now is all of the allergies that are coming out, not only of children being obese, but also because of all the processed food that we have out there. So we're seeing children as young as, you know, eight, nine years old with cardiovascular diseases of an adult in their 60s because of the processed fatty food that a lot of them eat. Without sounding alarming, but I, this is kind of a... Unless we react and we change the way we feed our kids, 
and we change the food system overall. We really, I think, we're not doing our kids, uh, we're not helping our kids to the future. Our children are doomed if we continue to feed them the processed food we do. So across this country, and it's now spreading around the rest of the world, I mean, all of the wonderful diets that were out there, we've now exported the fast food. So hopefully we can see a grassroots movement starting back in this country, which I'm, I'm seeing actually, not only in school, but everywhere. And hopefully we can export that out before it's too late, but it is a huge issue. Do you think as a community, do you think we're doing enough to tackle this issue? This is the kind of stuff we need to do as a community, is promote all the good and kind of overshadow the bad. And instead of constantly embracing uh, some of the maybe new food trends, is really promoting the good ones. As a community, promote good food, we need to promote it as good food and yeah. not so much as healthy food. Because right. I think the minute we go into this healthy food, people think of cardboard versus just good food. Yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of great stuff. You know, you have homegrown Minneapolis that's promoting this. You have a lot of fabulous local restaurants that are really trying to push some of this local healthy food. We've got a ton of farmers markets out there. So I think as a community between, you know, the, the activity that we have, we're one of the top cities across the country from a health perspective. So, you know, I think we're doing overall a good job. Uh, is there always room for improvement? Yeah, there's always room yeah. for improvement, but overall I think we're doing good. Coming up on our Issues Twin Cities, what our community is doing to rid childhood obesity here in the Twin Cities. Um, it's healthy because we do a lot of walking and a lot of exercising in school. So it's like if you go home and you eat a lot of junk food, it's like it's really bad for you. And your health-wise, it can be really bad for you. And I think it's good that we have a different, uh, like a different setting yeah. to have here when you come to school. Like it's only healthy food. Yeah. They don't feed us junk food here. I feel like after lunch, I'm more excited to go to class because then like. I'm filled with a bunch of healthy stuff and not just like, oh, I just ate a bunch of junk food. Launched by the First Lady Michelle Obama, the Let's Move campaign dedicates to solve childhood obesity within a generation in order to gear children on a path to a healthier lifestyle. So I think the timing was perfect. I'm not sure if everybody's on board with it, but what, what the overall initiative Let's Move what I felt was really good about it because it wasn't about just a silo. Mm. It was about let's move salad bar to school. It's about let's move chef to school. It's about let's move in general from an activity perspective. It's targeted to parents. It's targeted to children. It's targeted to chef, to schools, to community, to families. So because it's so broad, I think it's a great initiative because it wasn't pointing the finger at one particular area. Schools are just one of them. Uh, I, I think overall, you know, we do need to move. So it's, 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 you know, it's a play on word. It's let's move, we need to move. It's, it's put salad bars in school. Let's get, you know, some of the processed food out of school and bring chefs into schools. So I think overall, it's a great program. In efforts to help overweight children adapt a healthier lifestyle, our community has teamed up with the Let's Move Salad Bars to School campaign. Through this national initiative, donors and schools have connected with the goal of providing a free salad bar in every school. Washburn High School in Minneapolis was one of the first schools in the Twin Cities to add a salad bar with a variety of fresh vegetables and fruits. Tell me a little bit about Let's Move Salad Bars to School and a little bit of a take of the Let's Move campaign. So the Let's, Let's Move Salad Bar to School is a campaign and it's also one of the main objectives of Let's Move Salad Bar to School is one of a, a it's, it's basically a nationwide fundraiser to help bring salad bars into schools. So United Fresh, which is kind of the marketing arm of the produce company, uh, kind of organize, organizes the, the website and the fundraiser and the salad bars are donated through United Fresh. 
uh, and that's across the country. So you can go on Let's Move Salad Bar to School, you can actually yeah. donate to a particular school, you can donate to a district, uh, you have sponsors, you can donate individually. So the Let's Move Salad Bar is really about helping school get salad bars into the school. Once you get that salad bar, then it's up to you to do what you want with it, as long as you use it for, a, you know, for salad bars. So I think it's, a, it's, it's got a lot of great tips and ideas, but the main concept of Let's Move Salad Bar to School was about raising money for schools to put salad bars in there. When was the program first introduced in Minnesota? It started about five years okay. ago or so. Okay. Uh, and then school districts or schools that wanted a salad bar ha actually had to sign up on their website and, and make a formal request to be funded for salad bar, and then you became part of a pool of schools to get salad bars. Yeah. Uh, within Minneapolis Public Schools, we started buying salad bars two years ago okay. out of our own funds. Okay. And now we've received five salad bars through the Let's Move Salad Bar Through School. In addition, we received salad bars through our Chef Council fundraising. We've received salad bars through the Department of Health and Human Services. So we're kind of getting it a little bit from a lot of different sources. Mm -hmm. But the main initiative really, Let's Move Salad Bar to School, uh, gave us five salad bars. Okay. We could have gotten more, mm -hmm. but unlike uh, in some other areas, in, in Minneapolis, we need to have refrigerated salad bars. Mm -hmm. And as such, they're two to three times the cost of a regular salad bar. So we could have received probably quite a few more from uh, United Fresh, but because they're so much more expensive, they were able to at least give us five. Which is what were the reactions of the students when you guys first introduced the salad bars into the cafeterias? So we started at the high schools. Okay. And uh, I think the reaction to see their, their faces was actually pretty funny mm. because uh, we rolled them out at the very beginning of the school year and if you think about the, you know, when they finished the year before, all they had were fruits and vegetables in little plastic bags and all of a sudden here they come and they have a cool salad bar. So the reaction was overwhelming. Uh, we rolled them out at the same time that the new regulations mandated a, serve, a half a cup serving of fruits or vegetable for students to take. I think it would be safe for me to say that on an average at the high school level, students are consuming, not just taking, but they're consuming over a cup and a half of fresh fruits and vegetables. Not all of them, you still have your, I'm gonna eat my four carrots because I have to, but I think the weighted average overall kids are really, really taking it. And we're also using that topping bar, so for sandwiches and things like that. Uh, we've got legume, we've got grains, and you'd be amazed what they eat. So it's making a difference. Oh yes, yeah. It's making a difference in what they're eating, but it's also making a difference in, believe it or not, in the behavior in the cafeteria. They're much, they're, they're better behaved with whole food and salad bar than they were when they had a lot of... So, so why is that? My interpretation of it is, when the food respects the child, the child respects the food. I cannot see us going back. I would say to anyone who's listening that we cannot afford not to have salad bars in our schools. It's really one of the best investments we can make for our kids. So in our case, it's been very successful. Up next on our Issues Twin Cities, we take a closer look at how local farms are teaming up with schools to provide healthier options. Through the desire to help schools expand their use of locally produced healthier foods, the Farm to School program was created. It's a national movement. It's happening all over the country. Minnesota happens to be one of the leaders in Farm to School, which okay. we're very proud of. Basically, the main components of Farm to School are trying to get um, products from local farmers into the school meals and to have um, give children the opportunity to taste those local foods and have them as part of their, their meals. 
also to do education in the classroom around where their food comes from, how it grows, um, what it means, how does it get to their plate, mm -hmm. since many kids don't have that exposure, if they're, especially if they're in the city, they've never vis visited a farm, they don't know how the food grows. And then um, school gardens are also another component where they can really learn about how food grows and where it comes from and get that food literacy education as well. So those three components are the main components of farm to school programs. Different schools can choose to do different parts, so not every school can do all of the different pieces, but okay. they just start with the pieces that they can do and then hopefully they can expand from there. But our focus really is on the farmers. That's mm -hmm. where ITP started working on Farm to School. And we want to support Farm to School and Farm to Institution programs as ways to create new markets for small um, local farmers. So they might only be selling to a farmer's market to start with, but we want them to have other channels where they mm -hmm. can sell and they can diversify their, their business strategy so they have more opportunities to have new customers. And the good thing about Farm to School too is that they can, um, they buy at scale. So it can be a reliable market for the farmers that they know exactly how much they need. Um, if they have a deal with the, f with the school from the beginning, then they'll know ahead of time how much they want to grow and what they need to deliver and when. And then they can plan and grow that exact amount and know that they're going to be able to sell it to the school. Okay. So that's a really positive development. Oh, um, what type of healthy options then do the farmers provide to the schools? Well, they grow a lot of fruit and vegetables. Um, so. We mostly, with farm to school programs, we're working with diversified farms that grow a variety of different things. Mm -hmm. um, so they grow, you know, tomatoes, cucumbers, yeah. they grow um, lettuce and spinach. Those, some schools have been able to highlight those things. And sometimes they also will grow some special varieties of, of local products. So they might grow purple potatoes okay. or, um, you know, special purple carrots or something like that that gets kids kind of to take notice mm -hmm. and get excited mm -hmm. about it. But they grow everything. You know, our local farmers, we have a short growing season, but they can grow pretty much anything that they want, especially if they have um, a high tunnel or something to yeah. extend the season. Yeah. We're not limited in Minnesota. So I mean, cool. we have pretty much anything that they could want. One of the rapidly expanding programs of the Farm to School focuses on the children in preschool. We funded a project over the last few years that brought um, farm to child care to the whole New Horizons Academy um, s uh, school setting, preschool setting, um, that they were able to really bring system wide. And we knew if it could work in a setting like that, that it could also probably work in a, in a setting um, like Head Start where um, we're able to reach uh, uh, families and give them healthy choices when they drop their kids off for the day. That's something we really like to see. We've really worked on making sure our menus are healthy, that they're all from scratch that, that we have, aren't giving our children additives or a lot of sugar. And, mm -hmm. and to add to that, the ability to add locally grown products was really exciting. Um, just And also the idea for our kids, just children to start knowing that the food doesn't come from cow, it comes from the ground. Mm -hmm. And when you live in the city, sometimes you don't have that concept. Even though we serve families that come from in their home countries, very strong agricultural backgrounds. Once, you know, they're little, they come here when they're little mm -hmm. and they haven't seen that. And, and even though that's something that's really important to their families, they're just working hard to keep things going and, and you know, being part of that background doesn't come up. So we're able to reintroduce our children to, to the very culturally appropriate way of eating and growing and things that, that they should have all, you know, yeah always been aware of but when you're when you're juggling all the things you juggle in the city everything comes from cove and, and you exactly. you don't um, you don't you don't smell vegetables mm -hmm. you don't they're not the kinds of textures and things that that come right out of the farms. We did it because we wanted to a find alternative or new markets to sell to but also we wanted to get more fresh produce out there to the part to the public so they could have that and um, because so many of our farmers did have young grandkids mm -hmm. we were very interested in how young people's palates were being created and, it, and we always wondered if you could um, you know if you could make fresh produce familiar to young kids yeah. then when they would get older would they be more apt to eat fresh produce yeah. right because nowadays kids are 
are like, oh, I don't, I don't like that. I don't, right. you know, I don't want that. But if they've always been eating that, could they be like, oh, those are Brussels right. sprouts. I love them. Right. So when they're young. exactly start when they're young. Yeah. And actually, studies have shown that already by the time that they're three years old, their palate, their taste buds are being developed mm -hmm. already, so that you know the menu or the diet they have, it actually can project the type of health they'll have in the future because of their eating habits. We've had our challenges, but we've been able to overcome those challenges and work through them. And our staff have been wonderful mm -hmm. with with making sure that they're being very adaptable to any of the bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. um, I, with our fall, our spring season and even our fall season, we've had some challenging weather for for growing, and um, it's we actually had to uh, not use our first vegetable that was on our list, which was a big bump in the road. But our staff were were ready for the challenge and they yeah. took it on and um, it was actually really kind of nice because then they were able to talk about the farmers right. and how to grow items rather than jumping right into a food item. My feeling is that if you give kids the chance to try something, you know, some, I've heard from teachers that have done farm to school programs that they think, oh no, my kids are never mm -hmm. going to like that. But then mm -hmm. when they see what happens in the classroom, children are much more open than what they actually realize. Right. If you give them the chance, they will often try something. Right. And another thing, you know, it starts when they're young. It starts when they're young and they start developing their taste preferences mm -hmm. when they're when they're little. Mm -hmm. And there are studies that show that you need eight to ten chances of trying a food before mm -hmm. you really develop a taste for it. Okay. So there might be some things that are, you know, a little bit, they may not like it right away, but if you keep offering it to them, give them a chance, mm -hmm. then eventually that they do like it. Right. And a lot of teachers have said, I've, I've been surprised, but my kids will try anything. And it's more, it actually, um, a lot of it can depend on the attitude that the teacher goes into it with. And we see that when the, the teachers are enthusiastic, the kids really respond to that and they are open to trying new things. That, yeah. If you would like more information on the Let's Move Salad Bars to School campaign, or for more information on the Farm to School initiative, please visit them online. Thank you for joining me this week on Our Issues Twin Cities. I'm Renika Mann. See you next time.